Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Learning and Growing 2021 presentation, Bestowing Virtual Awards. My name is Julia Lyman, and I am a member of the customer support team here at Hawks Learning. Our presenter today is Dr. Linda May. Linda May is a principal lecturer at Arizona State University with a doctorate in social and personality psychology. She also specializes in consulting for publishers on the conceptualization and gamification of engaging interactive learning activities. We will have a live Q&A session with Dr. May today, so please enter any questions into the Q&A as we go, and we'll get to them after the presentation. Now, I will hand it over to our presenter. The floor is yours, Dr. May. Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you all for joining us today. And I set up my slides here for you, and there we go. So, you know, this idea of virtual awards is something I started many years ago before that idea, a uh, wonderful idea of badges came out. And this is a little different. It's certainly in the same category, but virtual awards, I think, are a little easier to administer and certainly more public, but in a FERPA approved manner. So let's dive right in here. Now, generally, we focus our energy identifying and trying to further motivate students who are having difficulty in our class. An example would be with our academic status reports, right? And this should be our first focus, right? These students need help and we need to increase retention. But oftentimes our best students get overlooked as far as special feedback especially in large classes. With this mini webinar today, I will focus on a quick, easy, and powerful way to reward exceptional performance, one that illustrates gamification and numerous other psychological phenomena. So let's see here. Whoever said, our classwork is so amazing that my roommates have to bribe me to pull me away from it. Whoever said, I get so engaged in our classwork that I put off eating, sleeping, and sometimes even relieving myself. No one, right? Yet this is precisely what many of our students say about gaming. Gamification in education is the art of identifying fun and addictive elements that are found in games and then applying them to education, to the learning experience. Now you tell me, which is more fun? Gambling on slot machines for eight hours and winning $100 or working in a factory pulling a lever for the same eight hours? and earning a $100 paycheck. Clearly gambling wins, even though both have the same financial outcome. This is because of two of the most prominent gaming elements, intermittent rewards and intrinsic motivation. Research has shown that rewards trigger the release of dopamine in winners' brains. And dopamine produces an addictive feeling of pleasure and urge to seek out that experience again. Dopamine is a powerful reinforcer. When you see texts awaiting you on your phone, dopamine is released, which causes you to check for texts more often. Now, your hypothetical $100 casino win was likely one in one two, five, and maybe $10 increments. And each one was accompanied by a dose of dopamine. These intermittent rewards of excitement and pleasure are clearly missing from the factory environment. And they are precisely what prompts the intrinsic motivation in gaming. Now, a pellet of food may work really well as a reward for a hungry rat, 
until the hunger need is satiated. And points in the class can motivate a student who is not yet making the grade they desire until they are safely there. But some uniquely human desires are intrinsically motivated and thus they are never satiated. Our highest achieving students are best motivated by these. These being achievement, mastery, and status. So I used a video game model to target these insatiable desires. When I designed the virtual awards, I bestow in my classes. Okay, this is really going to age me, but remember how video games before being digitalized um, were found everywhere at convenience stores? Some of you are certainly old enough to remember this and what a big deal it was, right? It was a neighborhood environment, right? And recall how the games always displayed the current top players like we see on the screen here, right? And how this mastery list would constantly change because players were motivated to move their status up on the list and even more to regain the status spot on the list that they lost to someone else. So imagine if you were the king at the top of the list and somebody else a week later dethrones you. Imagine how driven you would be to put more and more quarters in that machine, right? To dethrone your opponent and to regain your neighborhood status. So this is a basic model that I used in designing virtual awards for my top students. What do these highly effective virtual awards cost me? Not a penny. What do they look like? They are simply digital flyers that I design and send embedded in an email to the entire class after an exam. And they look like this. So these unique posting numbers represent students with the top scores in an upper level class of mine. And this usually represents A pluses and sometimes may include the highest A's also. Because my goal is to only post six to 10 of the highest scores in my upper level classes. So if there are seven perfect scores, I post them. If there are five perfect scores and four near perfect scores, I will post those nine and so on. So I'm always shooting for six to 10 to keep the goal high and to keep it inclusive. Now, the unique posting numbers provide a FERPA approved way to publicly bestow these awards. Most universities now acknowledge that student ID numbers are not um, private. And so they have unique posting numbers for students, but often faculty are not aware of this. So you can check with your institution to see if they do or to propose it if they don't, if you're interested in doing this. Now let's look at the winner's reactions. First, there is the dopamine reward from discovering their name on the list, right? Or their number. So the first response is that dopamine rush. Oftentimes, students will tell or message another student friend or two in the class that they made the list. I often can overhear this from the front row of students, right? Or students near the front who are doing this, telling each other this, busy on their text. Um, and often they tell me before or after a class, hey, Dr. May, I got a virtual award. Okay, so remember all the social sharing research? Sharing our disappointments helps to buffer them and sharing our achievements and the pride that comes from them repeats and increases 
that dopamine rush. Also, I often hear something like this from students. I got a virtual award on the last exam, but not this one. It is driving me crazy. I'm really going to make this next one. And this is called loss aversion in psychology. It is more disturbing to lose something you have before than to never have had it in the first place. The amount of pleasure you obtain from winning a new iPad is actually outweighed by the amount of pain you experience when you lose it. Loss can be a powerful motivator. So students are highly motivated to get back on that list by studying more for the next exam. And when they do get back on that list, this dopamine rush is supersized by loss aversion, right? Finally, another loss aversion effect I often hear is this. I am lower on the list than I was before, but I'm going to get back up there. In other words, students are competing with not just others' performance, but also their own prior performance. Now, you may have noticed that I mentioned that I give out these virtual awards in my upper level classes. I also use them in my intro classes, huge auditorium intro classes, but for a different purpose. Um, well, added on. So virtual words can serve yet another function in inter introductory courses. They can affect perceived norms. Intro courses typically have a fairly sized subset of students who don't do that well on the first test. It is tempting, easiest, and good for their ego for them to believe that this is because the class is too hard. The exams are unfair. This can cause them to give up at this point because fairness of the tests is not something in their control. So, of course, I do the typical things. I remind them of their study guides, their note outlines, and other valuable class resources they may not be using. I invite them to come in for study skills tutoring and other help. Okay. But virtual words in my intro class serve the same functions we described before for the recipients. But in these large 500 student intro classes, I give virtual awards for all A's. So when that subset of students that didn't do that well, see this many students getting top scores, it affects their perceived norms. They see that it is possible to do exceptionally well on the tests if you put in the effort. Usually I need more rows of the table. So as you can see in this example, instead of making this chart larger and adding them, I emphasize this by adding a second slide with a little note, wow, I had to resort to another chart just to get you all in. Very impressive. Okay. So what do you think? The purpose of these many webinars where we talk for 15 minutes and then have questions is to throw ideas out and to get our creative juices flowing. So does this inspire you to use virtual awards? For what else might you use them to reward students in your classes? Please share your thoughts in our Q&A. Thank you, Dr. May. We did actually get a question in. Um, Professor Hester at, um, asked about your class size and what class size you typically have. Um, she mentioned in regards to sending out those rewards, if it's six to 10 out of how many for your students? Okay, so typically that upper level class is um, 100. 
So at Arizona State University, where I'm at, is the largest enrollment university in the country. I believe that used to be Las Vegas, but we um, jumped over them. And so in my upper level classes, I tend to have 100 students. And that's why those six to 10 um, may represent all A pluses, or they may represent A pluses at some A's. Okay. And also the way that the FERPA approved numbers are being used here, these unique numbers that the students only share if they want to, um, you know, we can, um, we can, we can motivate them in this way. Okay. Thank you, Dr. May. We had another question come in. I heard on a radio talk show yesterday that some schools are moving away from honors, honor roll, and ranking based on what they see as an inequity. What do you think about that? As they see as what? Inequity. Inequity. Okay. Well, I actually have noticed in large classes, especially, that it is the top students that are oftentimes ignored. It's like, they're doing fine. They don't need our help. And we will focus all of our attention on the students are having a tougher time with the class. And so coming up with this idea of virtual awards, I wanted to come up with something that would not pull any time away from those groups who need it. Okay? There are a lot of ways in our courses that we can be more inclusive, that we can prompt more equity and justice, okay? And I do feel that this is one that's just kind of in a reverse direction. Thank you. We got another question. Um, do you use rewards for those that typically don't make the list, like perhaps a perfect attendance award? Um, that, I like to use badges for that. And so um, I will kind of use them in different ways in my class. Um, also, I like to use them. They're more private because you can't make them public unless you posted their unique numbers, but they're also sometimes a little more sensitive. Like I really like to really um, give a badge to a student for being one of the ones who increased their performance the most over time. So sometimes we'll have students will come into our office hours for study skills tutoring. And it's pretty amazing the difference that we can see in their scores. And so to do a quick analysis with my grade book, I can see who those are who, you know, are suddenly sprinting and sprinting at a pace, you know, that is really admirable and should be recognized. Okay. And our next question, could you explain precisely how FERPA is not violated? Use of social security numbers for posting is not allowed. So how is university given IDs different? Okay, so this is not student IDs. You will notice here what, there's a little note on the bottom. Okay, you put on your reading glasses, but I'll read it to you. What is your unique posting number? To look this up, go to my ASU and click on your name on the upper right. And it gives her a unique posting number under it. You remember in the old days, some of you will be old enough like me to remember in the old days that we used to paste on our doors, right? Lists of students' numbers and the grade that they got, their ID numbers and the grades that they got after an exam. And then we found out that you know, student ID numbers are usually not private. They're displayed openly on the student's ID card. They're handing that out to vendors and um, for events to get into certain events and using them in a lot of other public ways. Um, and so what we have done since then, we certainly would never use their social security numbers, eh? but the university has assigned unique posting numbers. Only the student has access to that. Okay? 
the student and the professor. So through our rosters, we can obtain the po unique posting number so that we can do the same thing that we used to be doing when we would post those exam scores. But in this case, a lot of people don't know about them because we don't post exam scores all together, usually like we did in the past. Um, now that they're available to students, you know, individually online. But um, I love to use these numbers for this purpose, which is for approved. Now, if the student wishes, and oftentimes, you know, if they're taking a class with a good friend of theirs and they're both kind of buying for space to get on this list, you know, they'll share their number with each other and text each other, hey, look at you got on it too, you know. Um, but that is totally up to the student. It would never be shared by any administration or faculty at our institution. Thank you, Dr. May. Um, we have a new question. Have you experienced any negative consequences of the virtual awards technique? I never have, um, you know, I, I have a hard time imagining that. Um, the, the one thing that I have thought about before is when the students who are not doing very well see this list, okay? It is true that it really affects their perceived norms and they see that it's possible, but it, it also could make them feel worse. And so that's a really interesting comment. I think it has more to do with, uh, you know, the buzz terms right now, a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And we should do a little mini webinar on that, um, which is really interesting because students who have a fixed mindset seem to feel like, you know, their performance indicates if it's not good, it indicates they're not smart enough, right? And people, students who have a growth mindset, they see this type of information that other students are succeeding as, wow, I could too, it is possible. The test must be fair, okay? And what's really interesting about the growth mindsets is there are things that we can do in class that actually prompt a growth mindset. So it's not like they're static. If they have a fixed mindset, that can never change. And by the way, you know, it's a whole nother, whole another webinar to, um, would be how to teach that, but it's best done by teaching neuroplasticity. Thank you, Dr. May. Um, so we have a few minutes left if you would like to enter more questions um, into the Q&A. Um, as for everyone who has joined us today, thank you for joining us. We'll save for just a few more minutes just to see if anyone else has any more questions. I'd also like a chance to change to thank Cox Learning for sponsoring these mini webinars and Julia for hosting this one. Thank you, Julie. And thank all of you for coming. All right, so it looks like we don't have any new questions. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. May, for your wonderful presentation. If you or any of your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our learning and growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the learning and growing website, which I am linking now in the chat below. So you can click on that link in our chat if you would like to submit a proposal. And we once again want to thank you for joining us today.